Um, thank you very much for your invitation and for the opportunity to share with you uh, the thoughts uh, of a whole group of, of people in the United States, um, others of whom will be talking at other points in this conference. Uh, but it is a fast-growing interest in the United States in the whole question of workers who operate their own enterprises. Before I get into that, let me make clear uh, the extraordinarily different way I come here this time from some of the earlier meetings I've been to. Uh, I now come not from a country that amazes people because nothing leftist happens there. I now come from a country where something absolutely extraordinary is happening. And so since I know you get different versions or interpretations of what's going, let me simply say to you that this is the most powerful, productive, exciting left movement in my lifetime in the United States. And you can see from my hair that I've been around. Um, and you know, I am a Marxist. I am one of those Marxists who is very pleased to be a Marxist and has no intention of leaving the area proud to be it and all the rest. So it's from someone with a perspective like that that this is, this is something that I think you will all find uh, will change the world soon the way it has changed the United States whose entire political and economic uh, system is trying to figure out what in the world is going on. No one expected it and it is, it is really extraordinary in every way and I urge you those of you that are not Americans to get a hold of the various Americans that are here just so you can hear firsthand what, what this is doing and how it's changing everything. So I come here with a much happier sense of myself as an American than I've had in a long time. Okay, um, here's what I want to talk about. I want to talk about uh, workers' self-directed enterprises. And you're going to see as I go along that this is very um, important. The idea here is for enterprises to be transformed, indeed for all workplaces, whether they're organized as enterprises or households or state institutions, that the work process is radically organized internal to the enterprise. To make it as simple as possible at the beginning and then enrich it as I go along, the idea here is that the workers displace and replace the capitalists with themselves. That the workers will begin to function in a double capacity. Whatever particular tasks they do inside the workspace, they will now, in addition to that, have a job description that also includes running the enterprise, making the decisions what to produce, how to produce, where to produce, and what to do with the profits. To make the image as concrete as I can at the beginning, Monday to Thursday from 9 to 5, you come and you do your specific task in the division of labor of the enterprise. On Friday, you come to work, and all day long with the other workers, you have meetings where you decide what to produce, how to produce, where to produce, and what to do with the profits. Since modern capitalism is organized mostly as a corporation, the summary way to describe this is that the workers become their own board of directors. The board of directors is no longer selected by the major shareholders, which is how it is done now. There will be no shareholders in the conventional sense, although the question of how ownership will be handled is a different matter, and I'll get to it at the end. But it's the workers become their own board of directors. I believe there are three sources or three aspects of this idea that bring it into being and that give it its theoretical and political force now in our conjuncture. So I want to go through those with you before reaching my conclusion. The first, and again, since I only have 25 minutes and People have been very strict with me about that. Uh, I can't give this the kind of detail here that I hope I can do in conversations with you later. So these are summaries. The first source or aspect of this proposal, or this idea, or this project 
has to do with its relationship with conventional socialism and communism. And the argument runs something like this. Conventional socialism and communism were differentiated from capitalism around two central ideas. Instead of private ownership of the means of production, a socialized or nationalized ownership, and instead of market mechanisms for distributing resources and goods, you used instead a planning apparatus. Market versus planning, private enterprise, socialized enterprise. Notice with me that these are both macroeconomic aspects of a society. They carefully avoid saying anything about the internal organization of the production units, like an enterprise. They leave that relatively untheorized and unattended to. As a result, the history of actually existing socialisms and communisms, while making dramatic changes in ownership and dramatic changes in the distribution mechanisms, from more reliance on market to more reliance on planning, did much less, relatively speaking, to the internal organization of enterprises than they did to these other dimensions of actually existing socialism. And if they did less to enterprises where work is produced, they did even less in households where work is produced than they did in enterprises where work is produced. So that the old existing organization of the enterprise, in the Marxian sense of the production, appropriation, and distribution of surplus in the point of production, in that area, relatively less, much less was changed. To say that in the colloquial, you got rid of the private board of directors and you substituted state officials. You substitute who was in the position, you didn't reorganize the enterprise itself. What did this mean? Several things. Number one, the workers were not put in the position of running their own enterprises. They still produced the surplus appropriated and distributed by somebody else, not the private board of directors, but the state officials in their place. Number two, the workers were therefore not in control of the surplus they produced in order to work out an arrangement with the state as to what the state would have to do to get its hands on the surplus without which the state can not function. The state does that with capitalists when they're private, and the state does that with state officials when they substitute for the capitalists in the private arrangement. What didn't happen was to give the workers that position. And I think that had two powerful consequences. One, it released the state from the dependence on the working class it would have had had the working class been in the position to appropriate the surplus it itself produced. And the consequences of that for the actually existing socialists, you all know. Number two, in the end, the failure to ground that experience in a transformation of the enterprise rendered the great achievements that those societies made in their socialist revolutions insecure and ultimately reversible. They didn't have something else that would have been necessary to secure the changes they did achieve in their revolutions by means of going through the macro transformations, market to planning, private to public, because they didn't add to it, add to it, the transformation at the base of society in the organization of the surplus. The second argument for source of dimension of the old idea of workers becoming their own directors has to do with what happened in modern capitalism. And here I'm going to use the example of the United States, but with a slight adjustment, it works for Europe as well. In the last great economic crisis, that is the one before we're, the one we're in, the one of the 1930s, capitalism, you know, is now in the second of its major collapses in 75 years. And according to the National Bureau of Economic Research, which is the institution in the United States that tracks our business cycle, 
uh, we had 11 downturns between the end of the Great Depression and 2007. Uh, and as I like to say to my students, and so I'll try it, see if it works here, if you lived with a person as in, unstable as capitalism, you would long ago have moved out or demand that this person get professional help. It is amazing that people don't make the same inference about the system. In any case, during that crisis, that was much worse than this one, at least than this one has so far gotten, please remember with me that we have an unemployment rate in the United States now, officially, of 9% with one kind of measure and about 17% with another, and I'll be glad to explain that if any of you are interested later. Uh, we had roughly twice that in the 1930s, so we are not uh, comparable yet. And it was a time of profound social struggle in which much was said that is said today, namely that there's no money to do anything other than impose an austerity, which you all hear every day, even if you're not Greek. Um, just to recall for you, in the depths of a greater depression than we have now, when there was arguably much less money available, the United States as a society spent more money on mass social programs than it ever had before or than it ever has since. We created in 1933 the Social Security program. There was none before. There was no federal pension program before. We created the unemployment insurance program in the United States, which had never existed before. And the federal government hired, hired 11 million workers between 1934 and 1941. How was this enormous explosion of mass-based funding the exact opposite of what the world is doing today in a crisis that's worse than today, how is it paid for? By immense taxes on corporations and the rich. The thing that is unthinkable today was the normal practice in the United States in the 1930s. We created a capitalism with a human face in that time. It was forced on the United States capitalist system by the combination of the crisis, which brought the country to its knees, and by the existence of three powerful mass organizations. The CIO, the Congress of Industrial Organizations, that produced the greatest wave of unionization in American history. We have never had that before, and we've never had it since. In the depths of the Depression, millions and millions of American workers joined unions in a militant operation and they turned on the government and they threatened. Number two, we had a powerful socialist party, and number three, we had a powerful communist party. More powerful then than it had ever been before and that it ever was again. And the combination of the union, socialist, and communists forced Roosevelt, the president, to change his own political stance. He was elected the first time as a balanced budget advocate. He became the advocate of the most unbalanced budget we've ever had. Overnight, it's almost like Merkel's change of heart about nuclear energy. In any case, everything was done to produce a pretty good, by American standards, social welfare system. But here's one thing that was not done in the 1930s. No effort was made to challenge or change the internal organization of American enterprises. Rather like what didn't happen in the Soviet Union after 1917, that didn't happen with us either. So as soon as the reforms were put into effect, Social Security, unemployment insurance, federal employment, and many other reforms that I haven't the time to mention, one of which you might be interested in, the law for the first time in American history that created a firewall between depository banking, commercial banking on the one hand, and investment banking on the other, called the Glass-Steagall Act. Immediately after the reforms were passed, the process, the program of the business community, which had opposed every one of those proposals, the strategy was to undo the welfare state, to undo the New Deal. The central proposition of the business community, adopted by the Republican Party from the beginning, was to unravel 
negate. And that was accomplished step by step. The first 20 years evade the law, evade all of the new regulations and the taxes. Next 20 years, weaken them. Last 20 years, eliminate them. The culminating points, for example, I'll pick two. The effort of the banking community to repeal the Glass-Steagall Act, to remove the prohibition and allow banks that take in deposits to make long-term risky investments uh, freely. And that was pushed through when? In the middle of the 1990s, by a democratically controlled Congress and gleefully signed by Bill Clinton as president rolling back one of the signal reforms of the 1930s. What else was done? Well, the first thing, even more important than bank laws, was to change the taxation of the rich and the corporations that had funded our social welfare program. Just to give you an idea, let me represent to you the gross numbers. I'm an economist, you invited me, and you know that if you invite an economist, you're lucky to get away just with numbers. I will not make graphs on the board, uh, exciting as it is for us economists to do that sort of thing. At the end of World War II, for every dollar earned by Washington by taxing individuals, it drew $1.50, 50% more by taxing corporations. What is the relationship today for every, 2011, for every dollar raised by the federal government on taxing individuals, it gets from corporations, business tax, 25 cents. Over the last half century, the burden of taxation has been moved from business to individuals. When I give this talk in the United States, I then stop and I say to my audience, Americans, that on behalf of the business community, I want to say to all of you, thank you. Very kind. Let me turn then to the tax on individuals, because they now had to pay everything. In 1950 and 60, the top income tax bracket, I mean, remember, we have no VAT, we have no national uh, sales tax or value added tax. We rely on the federal government on income tax, overwhelmingly, then and now. So we shifted it from corporations to individuals, and now let's look at the individuals. The highest rate in the 1950s and 60s coming out of World War II and Roosevelt was 91%. Let me explain. It's a progressive income tax structure. Every dollar over 100,000 earned roughly in 1950s and 60s. For every dollar a rich person earns over 100,000, he or she has to give Washington 91 cents and they kept nine. I can see from your faces, I'm not making this up. Do your Google work, you'll see. In the 1970s, it was reduced to 70%. For every dollar over 100,000 in the 1970s, you had to give Uncle Sam 70 cents, you could keep 30. What is the top income tax bracket on rich individuals in the United States today? 35%. Do you understand? Over the last half century, the burden of taxation was undone from the great New Deal. Instead of corporations, it's individuals, and instead of the richest individuals, it's everybody else. So of course, in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, we had a tax revolt of the mass of our people who didn't want to pay what they didn't quite understand but was the burden of taxation in our society, and that has not significantly changed. To overstate the point but to make it dramatic, capitalism with a human face lost its human face over the last 50 years. What was won in the 30s was lost ever since. We are now having a major debate in the United States, not about whether to cut our social security system, but only about how much to cut it. That's the only debate. It will be cut. So even that is taken away. Why? Because we left in place the existing organization of production. We left in place the major shareholders who select the board of directors, who gather into their hands all the surplus produced by the workers and decide what to do with it. And they decided to do what's in their incentive to do. Undo the reforms, 
remove the taxes. And because we left them in place in a position to do that, surprise, they did it. If you do not change the organization of production, you do not secure the socialism if you win it, and you don't even secure the social welfare state if you win that. Third source and aspect of this is Marxian theory, Marxian economics. And let me explain. As I understand and read and use Marxian theory, the three volumes of capital are about the production and distribution of surplus. They're not in the main devoted to property. They're not in the main devoted to markets versus planning or anything like that. They're devoted to the production and distribution of the surplus. That's what I get from that book, and I think that's what the fellow had in mind, but it's more important for me what I get from it. At the heart of this process is something called exploitation, in which production is organized so that some people, the majority, produce a surplus that another group of people, different from them, a minority, take into their own hands and distribute. Therefore, the idea emerges in Marx and from Marx of an alternative arrangement in which it isn't a different group of people who produce surplus and get it. That the breakthrough, the change, would be if the people who produce the surplus are also and identical to those who appropriate and distribute it. Hence the term self-directed workers. In a regular capitalist corporation, the private board of directors appropriates and distributes the surplus. They distribute a portion of the surplus. Marx goes through this in volume three of Capital in great detail. They distribute a portion of the surplus to the owners of the means of production, dividends to shareholders. They distribute another portion of the surplus they appropriate to the people who do the directing and managing of an enterprise, the managers. Therefore, for me, a crucial part of my interest in and my work on self-directed enterprises is to make it crystal clear that my focus, which doesn't have to be other people's, but my focus, is not on the property to whom a portion of the surplus, the property owners to whom a portion of the surplus will be allocated, and not on the management to which another portion of the surplus is appropriated. My focus is on making sure that the workers are the appropriators and the distributors, that they occupy that position as the key position that played the negative role in actually existing socialism by its absence, and that played the negative role in the history of capitalism a human face, again, by its absence. My last point, and I will within my 25 minutes, my last point. We are, of course, worried that we do not come up with a plan, an idea of this kind that cannot be translated into a concrete, immediate proposal of some sort. And so we are doing that in the United States, and I thought you might be interested. The plan is to use the crisis of unemployment in the United States. The Bureau of Labor Statistics, which is the government agency that provides this, the data of unemployment that we use, all of us, left, right, and center in the United States, it keeps a number, it keeps many unemployment statistics. One of them is called U-6. It, it counts three people, and it is the most widely used in the way I'm about to. The number of people looking for work that don't have it. The number of people that have been looking for work for six months or more and no longer look but don't have a job. And the third group is the number of people who have a part-time job but want a full-time job but cannot find one. That group now comprises about 17% of the American labor force. More than one in six is in those, one of those three groups. That means every American family is touched by unemployment. Brother, sister, cousin, uncle, somebody and often many. So this is a very profound problem, immediate and politically powerful in the United States right now. Our proposal works something like this. We want a federal employment program of the sort Roosevelt had in the 1930s, and we use that all the time. 
We attack Obama because he does not only not have such a program, he's not even proposed it. It is not part of the discussion in Washington at any time. Obama is as committed today as he was four years ago to providing incentives for the private sector. He provides the incentives, the private sector takes the incentives, but nobody gets hired. We propose a public employment program, therefore on a mass basis, funded by the federal government. The funds for it will be raised by moving the taxes back to what they were in the 50s and 60s. But they will be an employment program with a radical difference. The bulk of the money will be used to provide capital to unemployed workers who will be provided also with the assistance to begin and establish their own self-directed enterprises in order to do the following. Provide Americans with jobs and an immense incentive they don't have now to secure those jobs because it'll be their own enterprises. Number two that it will provide all Americans with a concrete example of what such enterprises represent as a new possibility. In the language that Americans like, it will be for the first time to provide Americans with freedom of choice. You can choose from now on whether you want to work in a top-down capitalist enterprise or one of these new kinds. It will create a new labeling system for all products. Is this the product of an old line hierarchical capitalist enterprise? Pew or a new cooperative worker control. It's a little bit like buying regular coffee or fair traded coffee, only now it'll be fairly produced coffee. Number three, it will be presented in the United States as the democratization of enterprise. A powerful argument will be made that American political democracy has always been purely formal and never real because it was based on an economic system that was the negation of democracy and that to realize actual democracy requires that it begin at the workplace, which is, most, which is the place where most adults spend most of their time in their life. And finally, we are taking a heed of a law passed some years ago in Italy called the Marcona Law. And if you, what? Makura Laws, my, my apologies. We don't know the details very much. It's the idea that inspires us. And if we understand the idea correctly, and please correct me if I have this wrong, uh, the Italian government, this law has been in effect for quite a while, provides an alternative or a choice to unemployed people. When they become unemployed, you can either go on the dole and get your weekly for however long you're allowed to, or you get the entire three years up front as a fund, so long as you get other workers to make the same decision, and then the government provides you with that lump sum to start your own business as a collective of workers. Fine. That's what we'll run with. And it's very interesting in the United States when we explain to people that we're not the first to come up with a plan. Here's a concrete plan to do that. So here's my conclusion, to make it as bold as I can. I don't think the American working class, I obviously wouldn't speak for anybody else, and I can't speak for the American working class either, but I can, pre I can pretend to be able to do that. I don't think the American working class is going to struggle the way they did in the 30s for a reformist program that they have now witnessed is insecure even when you win it. You struggle very hard, a long time, and you achieve something which is then undone because you didn't take the next step. In the 1930s, the trade unions, the socialists, and the communists struggled between a revolutionary program to try to transform capitalism and a reformist program to win social security, unemployment insurance, public employment. And they all made the decision to support the reformist program, even the communists and socialists. Okay, we did that. But to go to the American working class and propose that again, we'll get from them the, uh, the understandable response, which we Americans like to give to many things, no thank you, been there, done that. Not gonna do that again. And the same is true for, for traditional socialism. The way a new socialism and a new kind of radical politics in the United States might get going is if it explained and focused on the transformation of the enterprise as the unmet, unfinished, neglected dimension of the radical transformations of the past that are needed not only for their own sake, but as the only way to secure the reforms that were won in the past so we don't go back as we are now to the time before and have to start all over again. So it is for us a central 
political, economic, analytic, and programmatic focus on workers becoming their own board of directors. I did it. <laughs> Thank you very much.